Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the League of Women Voters Candidates Forum. Tonight, we're going to hear from the candidates for districts four, five, and six in Ventura. I want to make a couple of quick announcements. If you have a cell phone, please put that on silent or vibrate. We have turned in a request for some air conditioning. We'll see if that happens. The other thing we did is that we have divided up the candidates by their district. On the bottom of their name cards, you might be able to read what districts they are. District four closest to me, five in the middle, six on the far end. Uh, you will be voting for one person in your district. We are passing out maps that are provided by the city. If you didn't get one, you could try to look up and find out which district you live in. Although you only live in one district, we decided to have this forum with all of them because they all will support you or they'll represent you. You'll only be voting for one, but perhaps you want to work for another one or anything like that. Also, the city has on their website a very nice interactive map where you can go and actually put in your address and find out which district you are in. Plus, you'll be getting that on your ballot information soon. So we're going to begin with opening statements uh, to my immediate right. Mike Morostico will go first. But before we do that, I want to read a statement from one of the candidates that was unable to uh, participate tonight. This statement is from Wayne Morgan. He was candidate for District 6. Um, no, 4. Yes, you can see how hard it is, right? <laughs> you feel my pain. Great. Awesome. OK, from Wayne Morgan, District 4. Shortly after I filed to run for council member, my situation changed. It was too late to remove my name from the ballot. So although my name appears on the ballot, I am no longer running for city council. With that, we'll go to our first candidate for District 4, Mike Morostica. You have one minute, and you can see our timers up front. So my name is Mike Morostica, and I'm running for Ventura City Council. Uh, I currently reside in the East End. I also grew up in the East End, attended uh, Ventura schools. Uh, my wife also grew up in the East End and currently resides uh, in the East End with my family. Um, my three things that are most important to me are safety, community, and prosperity uh, in the area of safety. I'm a 25-year veteran of the Oxnard Police Department. Safety is a big priority for me. No one here uh, running against me has as much uh, experience at the ground level, boots on the ground, public safety experience as I do. Uh, my goal is to uh, eliminate the vagrancy issue here in the city of Ventura. Uh, I have ideas on how to do that. I deal with vagrancy on a daily basis uh, in my job, and I want to uh, be able to be safe in my city as well, and I want to be safe for you. Uh, I also want good paying jobs, and I want to make Ventura accessible to the next generation uh, pro by providing uh, starter homes so that the next generation can, can live here and thrive here like we did. Thank, uh, you. Thank you, I have to stop you there. Ed, our next candidate, Ed Alamillo. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I've lived in the East End all my life, went to all the local schools, graduated from Ventura College and Cal State Northridge with a Bachelor of Science in Health Science. I've been a senior agriculture quarantine officer for 15 years, and I presently work for environmental health for 12. As a uh, lifelong East Ender, um, I need to address the, our roads and sidewalks. A lot of our in sidewalks in our communities are clear violations of the American Disability Act, and this has been going on for decades. It's a uh, little disheartening that uh, this has been going on and kind of shameful for people that can't be able to use these sidewalks. Some of our neighborhoods are still on septic tanks, lack proper sidewalks and lighting. Uh, to name a few is Manor Avenue, Banner, Linden and Darting Road. This is also including the 126 sound wall that was uh, promised to the people that live off of Blackburn Avenue. So we have a lot of infrastructure problems that in our East End and I plan to address those issues and also look at the uh, city budget. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Spencer Noren. Good evening. My button. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you guys being here. Appreciate your time very much. My name is Spencer Noren, and I'm running for Ventura City Council because I love and I am passionate about this city. I cannot stop thinking about it day and night and how we can grow it better for our future. We can respect the past, we can listen to the past of being a small beach community, and we can continue to keep that vibe moving forward while we grow into the future. And that's something that I wanna do, create an environment where we can grow in the future together, where we can respect our seniors and their quality of life, where we can understand what the youth is growing through and giving them an opportunity for education and also creating an environment where we can all grow together. I know that as a young man who moved away to the Phoenix and Scottsdale area for about 10 years, up to Seattle and Bellevue for a little bit, I know 
know what it's like to leave Venter and want to come home so bad. So I'm creating an environment through safety, through work opportunity, and continuing to support the services that we have in this great city. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Alec Gaska. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alec Gaska, and I am too running for City Council District 4. And I'm running because I, w I am a part of your community, and together I think that we can change some things. I think that transparency is, a, is rather lacking currently, and I think that once we get somebody in there that can handle that, that can be that bridge between the community and the council, then we can all know more together and we can learn more and we can better the community together, you and I as a team, rather than you asking me to do things as city council, we will be, it'll be more of a, it'll be a partnership. So I hope to have your vote come November. Thank you. Our next candidate is Eric Nasarenko. Good evening. I'd like to begin by thanking David Marin, the League of Women Voters, CAPS Television, as well as the Ventura Unified School District for allowing us to have this event today at Citrus Glen Elementary. I'm going to depart for just a moment from the customary opening remarks. There are some outstanding candidates on this stage, as all of you know, but for the first time, we're in uncharted territory. We are vying in districts rather than at large. And what that means is in the past, you'd vote for no more than three or no more than four, an open seat. But today, you select a candidate amongst a smaller field, and that lends itself to a more contested, more spirited contest. What I pledge to do today and for the next 30 days is wage a fair, substance-based campaign, and I encourage all my colleagues to do the same, because at the end of the day, we're Ventura strong, we're one city, and on November 7th, we'll continue to be that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Marie Lakin. I just want to say it's really great to be here at Citrus Glen. That logo, the bear logo you see out there, I designed that when the school opened. So I have lived in District 5 for 33 years, and I have long been an advocate for my neighbors at City Hall. My experience is far-reaching. I have been a leader in numerous civic projects, spent 12 years on a city commission, and worked for three state legislators. I also worked at a public relations firm, which helped local businesses. In the legislature, I worked on important public policy like our state's water crisis and specialized in helping citizens with numerous issues. I believe water is one of our biggest problems. That is one reason I have been endorsed by the Ventura Citizens for Hillside Preservation. I believe the recent exodus of good citizens and good employees is a huge concern and from City Hall, and that is why I have been endorsed by SEIU 721, the city's rank and file workers. I'm hoping very much that the leadership vacuum that exists at City Hall is rectified with a new strong council. Thank you. Our next candidate is Jim Friedman. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Jim Friedman. I'm running in District 5 to help uh, protect and enhance the quality of life of the residents in the city of Ventura and also to be a strong voice for new economic development on the Ventura City Council. I previously served as mayor and council member from 1995 to 2004. I'm currently serving as a member of the Ventura Port Commission and have been doing so for the last six years. I've devoted thousands and thousands of hours at, in a leadership role to the city of Ventura. And I believe that this proven leadership experience is exactly what we need now as we transition into districts where we will have at least two brand new city council members and a brand new city manager. I believe my experience will help us deal with the challenges that we face within the next four years. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Lori Brown. Hi, my name is Lori Brown. Microphone, please, Lori. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Lori Brown. I'm running for uh, Ventura City Council District 6, which I like to say is a south side gateway to the city. I was born and raised as a native in the city of Ventura, from a child all the way till now. Riding my bike, climbing trees, playing in the Branca Vista Park. Um, this is my hometown. I'm running for city council, I like to say, one, because I'm native, two, because I'm qualified, and because, third, I'm ready to serve you. I'm qualified because I have a very uh, large background in economic development, I've worked for cities and the county government for years. I dedicated my life to public service, um, serving even on the city's downtown parking advisory committee. 
appointed to the Women's um, Economic Roundtable with the county by uh, Steve Bennett in District 1. I've also uh, worked for the Watershed Protection District. Have to stop you there, Laurie. Thank you. And we'll wrap up with Charles Kistner. Good evening. I'm Charles Kistner, and I'm also running for the 6th District. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and you for attending this forum. And I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I bring 25 years of experience working with community leaders and elected officials throughout West Ventura County. And I want to bring that experience to our city council. I want to provide visionary leadership committed to responsible government, economic vitality, and clean and safe neighborhoods. I will work with my fellow council members to develop more opportunities for Ventura's residents and future generations to live here and prosper. Once elected, I want to find out exactly where we stand financially so that we can plan accordingly. Um, we also need to develop a regional plan for housing, job creation, water, and other critical issues like homelessness and emergency preparedness. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to try and keep this interesting. We have a lot of candidates, a lot of questions. What I'm going to do is focus on District 4 initially. We'll stay with them so you get a feel for those, and then we'll move on to 5 and 6, and we'll get all the questions in. It's going to be more work for me, so please be empathetic. But we'll go ahead and get started with Ed Alamillo. First question to you, Ed, is there's uh, pension hikes that are scheduled over the next few years for the city. Uh, we have high costs for PERS. So what are your plans to ensure that these costs can be covered, uh, particularly with the unions if they decide not to reopen the contracts? How will you meet these uh, high pension costs that are coming? Well, I think I mentioned it before in the last forum. I myself, uh, I'm, I'm a government worker also, and so are two other, other candidates. Pensions were initially made to not to get rich on, but to survive with Social Security. It's gone out of hand where some people are getting rich on, and so it definitely needs to be addressed. Uh, the unions need to be addressed with also, but it comes down to the city council. It's the city council that says yes or no to these spikes, to these overruns of costs. So I want my pension, but I don't want it to be spiked. Or I don't want it to be uh, abused, and so I will look at that vigorously to make sure that they're in the realms of reality and not being abused for getting rich. Thank you. Thank you. Alec, we'll jump to you next. What are your thoughts on controlling the costs that are coming from pension hikes down the road? Yes, so like uh, was just said, they did talk about this at our last forum. What I would first do is I would just look at our city's budget because we have to, we're going to have to meet it. I, I'm sorry, but I'm not in favor of telling people, sorry, can you give it back? I, no, that, that, that doesn't work. So first I would look at, there are certain, there's a couple things. First is the portion of the budget that's for non-operational fee costs. It's a huge red flag for me just because of the fact, I don't know what that means. What, what is non-operational cost? Like I, I understand that you, know, you have to keep somebody there and whatnot. However, the immense amount of money that goes into non-operational costs around the city is far too great. And the way that we, deal with this pension problem is we have to pull money elsewhere. And then we have to address for future pensions, as was just said, it's council, the council then has to set these Have to bars. stop you there. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, you're up next on the question about controlling the pension costs or dealing with the hikes that are coming. It's a great question. When I was mayor, the city manager and I, with the council's approval, decided to stop paying our pension liability on a monthly basis, but rather to do so in one lump sum per annum. That saved the city of Ventura half a million dollars a year. Ellen Dombowski asked this question two weeks ago. She's here in the audience, and a group of business owners did the same. Let me give you some very stark numbers. Right now, out of our general fund, we pay $16.5 million in PERS-related costs. In five years, it will jump $7 million. So what do we do about it? Here are some options to consider, which I look forward to doing so with the council. One, should we float a pension obligation bond? That's one consideration. Should we go back to the bargaining table and renegotiate with our employees? That's another option. And then third, set aside a dedicated fund to deal specifically with 
pension cost, one that would be set aside and not erode have to and, stop you there, Eric. and cut Thank into you. our general fund. Mike, same question to you about controlling pension costs and uh, dealing with the hikes that are coming. So the, the, uh, the issue is how do you um, maintain uh, quality employees or keep quality employees while reducing your, your PERS costs? Some of the things that have come up uh, in recent negotiations in other cities uh, with employee unions have been non persable compensation. There is a way to compensate employees without increasing your PERS liabilities. There's things that we can offer them that don't count towards the PERS liability. And uh, associations and cities are exploring those options and are going to uh, more contracts that offer that non persable income or non persable compensation. So I, I look at that as a positive step. Uh, the other thing uh, to do is to go back to the employee unions and open up negotiations or try to open up negotiations and give them the ability to pay a greater share of their retirement costs, which most cities are doing, including the city I work for as well. Thank you. Spencer, we'll wrap up this question with you. Sure, thank you. Oh, excuse me. Um, I'm going to first and say the police and fire are the most important thing that we have in this city. And what a great job they did during the Thomas fire and every day since then to keep us safe in this community. And I respect the police and fire having friends and family on both Ventura fire and Ventura police to where the question of benefits will come up and pensions will come up and you work together with the union and the police and fire. And what you start to avoid is the us versus them within the stations and within the police department because it's starting to happen and affecting morale now. So as the pensions start to drop, there's a divide coming in. I've been talking and giving testimony from police, fire, Oxnard and Ventura. Everyone is aware of this. And the most important thing and the greatest thing is that the police and fire are understanding of this and they don't want to cripple the economy and on our budget just as much as the, 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 they're aware of it at City Hall. So work together with the police and fire, come together with the union, give them some more pay, give them some more benefits, and start to dial down eventually. Thank you. I have to stop you there, but we are going to start the next question with you, Spencer. Yeah. So what can we do to bring good paying jobs to the city of Ventura? What can I do to bring good paying, good paying jobs to the city? First and foremost, I can be a promoter and a salesman for this great city. We have to have somebody on city council that is out and about in the community, going to all the meetings, going to all the conventions, going to all these great social events and promoting this great city, and we do it by bringing in more business and doing responsible growth on infill. And we do it by simple things like getting rid of our near rosette water fee. We have become a city that's impossible to grow in. And businesses and investors all over this state know that we're a city that you can invest in because of why? Because we've got too many permitting fees and we're not friendly to work with. We have to do it responsibly. We have to understand that there's a water shortage and we're in a drought. But at the same time, we have to move forward. We have to create revenue to supply the services that we depend on daily in this great city. Thank you. Mike, same question to you about bringing good paying jobs to the city. So, What you need to do is you need to create a better climate or a more, uh, an easier climate for businesses to grow and thrive. Um, I also think that uh, we need to uh, improve in the area of uh, housing and jobs as well because companies like Patagonia, uh, when they're trying to recruit an executive, the two questions, two most important questions that they have to answer to, to recruit that executive is where are they going to live and what job is their spouse going to be able to get? So I think if you answer those two questions, you're going to create a better business climate, and I think you're going to be able to draw more businesses to, uh, to this great city of ours. I agree with Spencer that we need to look at our fee structures, and we need to look at how easy or how difficult it is for a business to start, uh, and I think we need to make that a heck of a lot easier uh, to start a business here in Ventura. Thank you. Ed, same question to you about your vision for bringing more jobs to Ventura, high-paying jobs. I, I think we really need to look at our city as a whole. A lot of companies look at the environment of our city. If the cities have terrible roads, terrible transportation, and, and don't lack the infrastructure, they're not going to come here. Um, I know our, one of our biggest companies is Patagonia, the government center, um, and the school districts. So for me, is reaching out to those companies and asking them, what do you need us to do to make it more desirable to have your employees grow here? Like I said, uh, Patagonia, uh, I have friends there that they say it's, it's just not desirable some of the places in Ventura. 
So we're really going to need to look at our infrastructure to try to cater to this, uh, this industry. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll go to Eric next for your thoughts on bringing high paying jobs to Ventura. First, understand your assets. Among them in this city, what we call the Wellness Corridor, Community Memorial Hospital, the Ventura County Medical Center, the recently opened Kaiser. We have a burgeoning medical field in Ventura that supports and creates high paying jobs, nurses, doctors, physicians' assistants. We need to continue to nurture that area, and Councilwoman Weir has done a phenomenal job in doing so, as has the council. The other area is in the tech sector. The city council should help Trade Desk to expand from its existing Chestnut location across the street. They're a worldwide billion dollar company. We also should support new leading internet companies like Fresh Realm, which recently opened downtown. And then lastly, when you talk to the development in the business community, what they want the most from the city is predictable dates, timelines, and policies that can be followed with certainty and not changed with council meeting to council meeting. That's what we need to do as a council, to stick by our policies and make sure they're implemented fairly. Thank you. Alec, we'll wrap up with you. Thank you. So how do we bring good jobs to the city? The first way we do it is to just make them more accessible, make people more aware of them. There are several job fairs that happen throughout the city and whatnot, but we have to, as a city, and again, this is the job I think of city council at the base level, is to encourage people through job fairs, host great greater city job fairs, and make sure that they're available to everybody and that everybody's aware of them. But the next thing we have to do is we just have to encourage business to be here. We, we can encourage people to take the jobs that we have, but yes, our, our community is growing, and eventually, those jobs run out. We have to encourage business to come here. And one of the ways we do that is, one example is to use, to create a grocery store on the East End. There are several, there are several things, but that is, I mean, the amount of jobs that that would bring would be amazing. And then the next is to help with college. We have to encourage our students to go to college. We reference the tech and we reference medical. Our Ventura College has an excellent medical program. We have to encourage people Thank to you, be Alec. involved. Thank you, Alec. have to Thank stop you. you there. Eric, we're going to start the next question with you. Let's um, talk a little bit, candidates, about your qualifications. What makes you uh, prepared to do the job, your experiences. In particular, council members are required to make decisions on many topics. Tell us about your qualifications to make decisions on things like public safety, public works, development, you know, how have you been involved in the city and learned these things? Begin. Sure. Well, let me talk about public safety. This morning I met with a mom and her son who are expected to testify tomorrow morning in a hearing. They're here in Ventura. The son was scared. He had never testified before. He's 14. My job as a district attorney is to walk him through the courtroom process, help him understand what's going to happen, and also be someone who's a proponent on behalf of our children here in Ventura. Uh, the other thing that I feel very passionately about is making sure that our city remains safe. And the way to do that is through fire, paramedic, and police services. In 2013, when I first got elected, we had 126 sworn positions. Today, at the Ventura Police Department, we have 139. I've served this city both as its mayor, its deputy mayor, and now as its council member. Before that, I was a library commissioner. I bring a wealth of experience to this position, and also my day job informs what I do every day on your behalf to protect and serve thank, thank you, children Eric. and women. Thank you. thank you. Spencer, same question to you. Tell us about your qualifications to uh, handle some of the many topics that come up before the city council. Absolutely, thank you. Being born and raised at CMH in 1980, I'm proud to say that my grandparents had a great business called Norn's Market, a staple on the east side for 30 and 40 years that I grew up day in and day out working and learning the experience of what it took to be a member of this community of Ventura. And that's what a city council member is, right? Somebody who's willing to listen, to be acceptable. I'm not looking for endorsements from any businesses or any group. I'm looking through endorsements to the individual and the people of Ventura. And that's the experience that I bring, going to Juana Maria, Balboa, and Buena, riding my bike on the streets. Knowing District 4 better than anybody else in this town, I guarantee you, from working at Peking to Longs to Subway, I could tell you about how being married for 12 years, having two children, and being a bartender and an, an, an event coordinator up and down the state of West Coast gave me the experience to understand people 
And that's what this job is. It's understanding the people that we work for so seven individuals can come together, work through the city manager, Thank through you, the Spencer. city attorney, and make Spencer, this a great I'll, place I'll to live. There. Okay, we're going to go to Alec for your uh, answer. Please tell us what makes you qualified to make the many decisions council members have to make. Thank you. What makes me qualified is that I I'm, am you. We, we are a community. I am a part of your community. I see you every day. I work with you every day. We do things together every day. That is the biggest part of what makes me qualified because it's not, like I said earlier, it's not a you ask me and I respond. No, it's a, it's a partnership. What makes me qualified is if tough questions come up, and as we know they do, as if you attend the city council meetings, you know that the hard questions come up. When these come up, you have to know to ask the right people in your community. And through my work with different charities, I'm currently the vice president of Knights of Columbus charity, which works with homelessness and works to help better the community as a whole. And with my work with Catholic charities, I work again with homeless once a month, every month to work to understand what it is they need, to understand what our community needs of them. So I know how to reach out to the community to help answer these questions. Because again, it's an us. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, same question to you. What are your qualifications, please? Oh, I'm sorry, Ed. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. As a uh, senior agriculture quarantine officer, I don't know, I've run across various laws and regulations uh, pertaining to health and safety. Also, as a, one of the lead negotiators for contracts in the past four years for SEIU and the county, I know the ins and outs of laws and labor laws and budgets. So I will take that knowledge with me because uh, I, like I reiterated, reiterated it once before, uh, the pension issue is a huge issue and it wasn't set up for that. It's in a lot of cities, it has broke a lot of cities. And for me, it's dealing with that, that the roads and sidewalks, the lack of funding in the East End. And that's one of my main core issues for me to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, we'll wrap up with you on the question of qualifications. Well, as far as making uh, decisions, difficult decisions, uh, I virtually make difficult decisions uh, every day for the past 25 years. Those decisions I make on a daily basis have impact on not only people being victimized further, but also decisions that could take away somebody's freedom. So I'm used to making those difficult decisions, and as your councilman, I will make those difficult decisions uh, and, and not have a problem doing it. Uh, that's what I chose to do. That's why I'm running. As far as what goes on in the city, uh, I know that the people that are out there on the front lines, whether it be water, uh, landscaping, parks, police, fire, uh, they know things. And a lot of times when they bring it up their chain uh, command and it gets presented to the council, it's entirely different. I know that those folks uh, make a difference and I know that they know the answers and so I'm going to go to them and I'm not going to trust the city staff or the, the lead staff uh, trust exactly what they're saying all the time. Thank you. You other candidates feeling left out down there? <laughs> Why don't we give you some questions then? We're going to start with District 5, and Jim Friedman, you'll be up first. So tell us about your solutions to the water problems here in Ventura. What are your solutions to solving the water sh shortage? Would you support a moratorium on new development? And just a quick personal thing, do you actually, are you a um, Ventura City resident paying a city water bill? Just for the voters. So I, your position resident? on solving the water problem, do you support a moratorium and are you uh, paying water bills? Uh, I don't support a moratorium because we would be um, sued for inverse condemna condemnation if we were to do that and were anything, uh, if we were in stage three, if we moved to stage four or five, uh, then we could uh, possibly uh, initiate a moratorium. You asked me too many questions all at once. Solving the water problem, how would you well, say Well, if I had that answer, I wouldn't be sitting here right now, I can assure you. But um, obviously the city is working towards that. Hooking up to state water is essential. Um, it's expensive. It'll be a total of about $55 million. Uh, the number of 23 million has been floating around, but it's actually closer to 55 million. Um, we obviously have to recycle because of our lawsuit that we have regarding our, the estuary. Um, I'm, I can see I'm going to run out of uh, time. But for those of you who want to stay afterwards, that, this question deserves a lot more than one minute. Thank you. 
Right, no question, it's a, a difficult issue. So why don't we just focus on two things. Charles, you're next. What are your solutions to the water shortage problem and would you support a moratorium on new connections? So you're gonna go out of district then? Sorry? You're not gonna stay in district five? No, I'm gonna include you and Lori. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> All right, uh, well, as far as far as the water issue goes, obviously there are a lot of uh, options out there. And uh, I went to a water board meeting a couple months ago, uh, and I found out that a lot of the water people uh, had not been communicating with each other. This is one of the first times they had all gotten together when they got a chance to see the $400 million worth of options that were available. Uh, the presenter could give us the acre footage of what was going to be produced by each of these, but when I asked them, what are each of these individual projects going to cost, he didn't have the answer. And on top of that, when he referred back, he said, well, you know, I, it's going to be like 400 to 600 million dollars. So it already went up 200 million dollars while it was sitting there. So the bottom line is we need to have the state water. We need to work regionally on this issue. We can save ourselves some money. We can't be territorial like we've been in the past. And uh, I think we have some options out there that are better to look at that won't be as expensive, but we need to find out how much it'll cost. Thank you. Uh, Marie, we'll go with you next. So we are doing districts five and six. I'm combining them. So Marie, what are your suggestions or uh, what are your plans to solving the water shortage? Would you support a moratorium? Well, back in the 90s, the voters asked us to diversify our water supply. And councils since then have kicked that can down the road. And I would say right now we are shortly in a crisis. Uh, Casitas is now at about 30%. That's a third of our water supply. So what do we need to do? We need to hook into the state water inner tie over in Camarillo Springs as soon as possible. And they say maybe that's 2023. That's about a $75 million capital project. And it's only in draft DIR stage right now. We need to um, start our city's indirect potable reuse program down at the harbor. That's another $175 million dollars. How do we pay for this? Uh, you know, back when we asked for desalinization in the 90s, it was about 30 million dollars. Now we're looking at 240 million dollars in capital projects. It's going to have to be bonded. We're going to have to do pay as you go. Uh, the net zero water fee is helping that a little, but it's also a big burden on our businesses and anybody that wants to build thank, affordable thank housing. Maria, I have to stop you there. Thank okay, you. Thank Lori, you. same question to you. Your solutions for water shortage and also the moratorium. Microphone, thank you. My understanding is that the mor moratorium is already written into the general plan that if we get to stage six. So I do support that at stage six to go into the moratorium. Anything before that, it may be necessary, but of course that would have to go to a vote. And I believe that this city should have the opportunity, these residents, to weigh in on that. When we talk about the water, uh, you hear us saying the casitas and 30% and here and water over here, we have lawsuit and we're not getting along. I think the communication between the cities also need to pr improve so that we have the opportunity possibly to repair some of those relationships in the past that have been ruined because either we were pulling too much water or they needed to protect their own resources. In addition to that, we do need the state water, everyone's saying, but we also need to focus on what we can do in the interim. Again, only 10 seconds left, so not enough time to really fill in all that information, but I'd be happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Lori, we'll stay with you for the next question. Uh, what are your plans about addressing the homeless situation? Specifically, um, the homeless situation seems to have gotten worse even after the murder, the tragic murder down at Aloha Steakhouse. So what do you believe can be done to focus on homelessness and criminal elements and also homeless that are parking, camping around the city? Well, first, I think we need to be sure that we uh, separate the tragedy of that incident of the person being murdered uh, with the homeless issue as a whole. The mid people with mental illness, people that have drug addiction, families that are women and children on the street, veterans, these are all uh, different types of homeless people on the street and we need to attack the issue in that same vein, uh, each on a case-by-case -case basis. What was the second part of the question again? As far as homeless that are actually in cars but parking in apparently spots that they're not okay. supposed to. Thank you. So the Circuit 9, um, that question I'm assuming is brought up because it's a Circuit 9 uh, court ruled not too long ago that we can no longer as a city uh, criminalize someone who's sleeping in their car if they're parked in front of your house. 
Um, and so that's a big concern for a lot of people, especially since we're a coastal community and there's, it's good weather, and how do we get, how do we address this? And I believe it is a conversation that has to be opened up to the community, but we do still have the opportunity to address the issue when it comes to Thank you, criminal, Thank criminal you. issues. Thank you. Marie, same question to you. What are your uh, plans to address homelessness, crime related from homelessness, and also homeless parking? Absolutely have to separate the difference between people who are just merely homeless and poor and those who are conducting criminal activity in public. Now, here in the city of Ventura, we've invested heavily in new policing out on our streets, our patrol task force, our clean and safe initiative. Uh, policing, I think, around $600,000 more uh, just to you know, get the criminal element off the streets and into uh, services, some sort of help, um, or maybe they just need to be in jail for a while. Now, for the homelessness, the merely homeless, I absolutely support our shelter. What we are doing right now is we are taking an existing county building and we are partnering with the county to, and I think it'll be on a referral basis, to get folks the help they need over there. And I'm hoping very much that this will be a family-oriented shelter um, oftentimes we separate families, like the lighthouse, they will only accept, uh, you know, women and children. Um, I have to stop you, Marie. Okay, thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Okay. And uh, Charles, let's hear from you your thoughts about homelessness and the crime related to it and also the parking situation. All right. First of all, I've been working with the uh, Continuum of Care, which is uh, organized by the county. Uh, and I've been on the Housing and Services Committee for the past three or three and a half years, addressing the homeless issues, evaluating what services are needed and what housing is available and what type of housing is appropriate and so on. Um, number one thing that we have right now is we've got a uh, year-round shelter that's gonna come online. The unfortunate thing is that the folks are gonna receive services, they're gonna transition through that, get jobs, and then not have any uh, temporary housing to go to after that. So basically, they will have lost and we will have wasted our money. So we really need to think the whole plan through. We, we need to get these people back on their feet. One of the things you're talking about, the people living in the cars, you know, I know that most of the people that are living in the cars are senior women. And uh, it's gotta be very, very scary for them out there. And I think they are all fairly recently homeless and they're the first ones that we should really try to do something for. But you gotta remember there are lots of different Thank types you, of homeless people. Thank you, Charles. Just a reminder to all the candidates to keep an eye on the timers. Jim, you're up next. Your answer to the issues of homelessness. Thank you. Um, homelessness is a clearly a regional issue. Unfortunately, the city of Ventura far, far too often bears the brunt of, of the problem. I really believe that we need to strengthen our partnership with, this, with the county. They're the ones who have all the services. In Ventura, we basically have the police who arrest these people. Uh, if, if, if it's a criminal act, and now unfortunately they're in jail for four hours and then back on, on the street. I think we need to make um, our own city ordinances tougher on criminal vagrancy so we can have these people move along. Um, there are things that we clearly can do at the city level, but it's gonna take uh, a majority of the council to make that happen. Um, the, <clears throat> regarding the parking issue, um, I do know that, I believe it's the Unitarian Church off of Ralston, they have a, sleep, a safe sleep program, and I think one of the options we could do is expand that program with some of the other service providers. Thank you. Thank you. Charles, we'll start the next question with you. So, like the other candidates, share with us your qualifications to be on the City Council. The question is, City Council members are required to make decisions on many topics. Tell us your qualifications to make decisions on things like Public safety, public works, development. Tell us about your involvement with the city. Okay, uh, great Not question. Perfect. First of all, I've been involved in uh, politics, running political campaigns and doing public relations for the last 25, 26 years now. Uh, I've done a lot of work in Ventura and in Oxnard. And I've uh, got great relationships with people like Scott Whitney, who's now the chief over there. And we've spent a lot of time actually talking about homeless issues and vagrancy and what we can do in the community over there. Um, I've also got uh, friends like Mike Morostica who's uh, told me an awful lot about what goes on down at the grassroots level, the boots level that he talked about and stuff and, and what they need. Same thing that we need over here. We need support and direction from the council to, to make sure that the police and fire uh, are supported and know exactly what they need to do. 
Um, my other thing that I want to say is that while I run these campaigns, I also advise these candidates, uh, these elected officials, uh, we have, you know, we're friends, we have conversations, we get together all the time and talk about things. So I've spent years studying all the issues that are going to come to this council. Thank you, Charles. We'll go to Lori for the same question. Tell us about your qualifications to be a city council member. So first, as I said earlier, I dedicated my entire career to public service, and that started with uh, getting my college degree in uh, master's in public policy and administration from Cal Lutheran University. I also have an associate's in bilingual studies because I saw the need to understand the culture of the community that's growing within our own that represents 30% of our community, that's the Latino community. Um, in addition to that, I've worked uh, as a project management lead for over six years, uh, managing capital improvement projects of over a, a half a million dollars a piece. I managed two programs that I worked with building safety and engineering. I worked with code compliance, planning, uh, the city clerk's office, general counsel. I understand exactly how sitting, but city budgeting works, expenditure accounting, and I also um, uh, worked with related agencies like the Downtown Business Association. I worked with businesses downtown. I contracted contractors, and a lot of times city managers, oh, that's my time is up. Yes, thank you. And we'll now go to Jim for the same question about your qualifications. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, uh, serving as mayor and council member and uh, port commissioner for the past six years, I've dealt with numerous issues involving the city. I've spent thousands and thousands of hours. I've been involved with 14 public budget processes, eight as a council member, six as a port commissioner. Um, this is experience that, and no disrespect intended, that nobody up here has that degree of experience, even my friend Eric Nazarenko, who's been on the council for uh, coming up to five years. Um, it's complicated, to be a council member is complicated. I learned a tremendous amount when I was there. I have already voted on hundreds or probably thousands of issues, oh, well, maybe hundreds, several hundreds, I don't wanna go crazy. And so I actually have a record where most people up here don't, and you can look at that record and see what got done between 1995 and 2004 and make your determination. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, we'll wrap up with you. What are your qualifications? for the job? Well, I've been down at City Hall for 12 years now on a city commission. I've been very involved down there. Visitors and Convention Bureau Board for 10 years, many different city committees, and I've just been very big advocate for the East End all the time. I always say, you've forgotten about the East End, we need to do more. In addition to that, I have worked for the three state legislators in three counties, so I've seen very closely how other cities conduct business. I've worked on national, international related policy, state policy, and I really have that breadth of understanding and I can bring that here that no one else on this diocese has had because I have worked on issues that affect us all and affect the nation. And this is something I will bring, and this absolute breadth of experience will serve me well as a city council member. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to come back to District 4 here. We'll get some of these questions in as well. Alec, uh, you'll be up first on this question. So let's hear from you as far as your solutions to the water problem. What would you do about the water shortage, and would you support a moratorium on new construction? Thank you. My solution as was stated by one of the other candidates, is to have a conversation with you. Talk about it, figure it out together. I'm not gonna tell you what the answer is, although personally I believe that we need to, one of the first things we can do is immediately, and it's already in the works, immediately connect with the state water system. And then we need to work with our recycled water for agriculture and other uses, but we have to do that now. But I wanna have a conversation with you about it. I wanna talk about it. I wanna know what you think. And then we'll figure it out together what we do. As far as the moratorium goes, as long as we can go without it, I would like to. That said, I'm not entirely opposed to it, but I'm not opposed to it, however, in order to continue to further business and to help so many other things, especially on the east end of town, we can't have a moratorium. But if it comes to it, then yes, we may need it. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, 
Please tell us your solutions to the water shortage problem and your view on a moratorium on new hookups. When you think about water, you go to two boxes, the first of which is infrastructure, which this council has addressed. That's in part why water is costing us all more. For example, we just approved an $8.5 million sewer line replacement on Harbor. That's one third of the city sewage going down those pipes into our wastewater plant. That's a necessary infrastructure improvement that will help Ventura in the long run. Secondly, you have to ask yourself about supply. As has already been talked about, reclaim water through indirect or direct potable reuse, as well as tying into state water. As Kevin Brown, our general manager, told me, Eric, there's tons of water out there. We just don't have the ability to get it into Ventura. We will by 2022. In terms of the moratorium, we hired a group of experts to talk about a water shortage event contingency plan. They told us on each stage what should happen. Right now, we're at 20% reduction, stage three. We've been there since 2014. Next year, if, our, if we go above 30%, we'll have to go back to developers and say, unless you bring us water, you're not going to get a permit. If Sorry, it goes Eric, I have to stop you there. Thank you. So, Mike, uh, same question to you. What are uh, your solutions to the water shortage? Yeah. Again, you know, with one minute to answer this question, it's, it's extremely difficult, but like other people on, the, on this uh, forum, I support an immediate connection to state water. I also uh, am an advocate of uh, potable uh, reuse, direct and indirect. Uh, Oxnard is doing things with potable reuse. I've talked to council members uh, from Oxnard who have told me that it is possible uh, to work, uh, for Ventura to work with Oxnard and connect to their potable reuse system. And so that would actually save us money rather than trying to come up with our own. We could connect with Oxnard. Um, I, as far as a moratorium, again, uh, if necessary, I, I would support it, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Spencer, you're up next. Your solutions to the water shortage and the moratorium. Uh, thank you. Yes, if the drought does continue, I would support a moratorium if it continued that stage, but it's not going to because we're going to access water and we're going to use all the possibilities we have. We're going to connect very rapidly as fast as we can with a state water connection project that we have owned the right since 1972 that the Ventura City Council hasn't addressed and come, come, to, come to grips with to bring us that water to us. We're going to work with our relations with Casitas. Three years ago, we lost the rights on the east side to have our mixing stations mix the water that was bringing Casitas to the east side, which the council let us down on the east side about that. And we're also going to look at what we're going to do with recycled water across the city. We've been in a stage three drought. Within the stage three drought, it says we're supposed to be trucking recycled water and watering our parks. We're currently not doing that. So there are ways to hold the city accountable to creating more water options along with what we have going on the direct and indirect potable reuse. Uh, plant going on as well, where I'm in big favor of indirect potable reuse and not a fan of direct potable reuse. That is where the water goes directly from your toilet to the plant, thank, thank you, back Spencer. to your tap. Thank I'm you. not a fan of that. Spencer, thank you. Okay, Ed, we'll wrap up with you. Same question about water shortage and a moratorium. Well, I'm in favor of connecting with the state water. Uh, it's clean, it's safe, and I don't want any residents to get uh, sick on any type of we use water. I just don't see it being a, a, a viability. One of the things that hasn't been talked about is the purging of ag pumps. The ag pumps, ag wells purge a ton of water and we need to recapture that. You can see some of our barrancas, the, the reason why they're flowing is because they're ag wells. They're purging out that water at a horrendous rate. We need to look at that and be able to see if we can tap into that water, recycle it, um, I, I agree with some of the other people on this community also on the, that we need to we, we look at our, our recycling water. We need to do, do more like Oxnard has. So th those are my issues. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm just curious from the audience, is this format working for you, jumping around a bit? You, you, everybody feels like they're getting their money's worth? Great. Thank you. Okay. We are going to start with Mike on the next question. And uh, this is a little bit more long-range thinking for all of you. But uh, due to climate change, it's projected that perhaps the Ventura Keys, the State Beach, the fairgrounds, maybe parts of Ventura could uh, be seeing higher water levels or even underwater uh, as we see sea level rise. So that's the specific question, but in general, tell us your views about dealing with climate change and the impacts that may hit Ventura because we're a coastal city. So because we are a coastal city, I think we need to be thinking about that possibility. Uh, I know all along the, uh, the state, the Coastal Commission um, is 
say in the, the phrase managed retreat a lot. So I think we need to look at that as a, as a distinct possibility and we need to look at uh, what resources we have uh, close uh, to the shoreline that could be impacted and we need to start uh, long range planning uh, for those uh, things uh, that could severely impact us if the sea levels do rise and they eventually, you know, enter into our uh, shoreline. Thank you. Ed, share with us your thoughts about climate change and the impacts that may happen to Ventura. Well, <clears throat> I think that we really need to work out with uh, FEMA, look at some of their maps and see where some of the zones that are going to be affected in our community. Uh, we know the coastline will be affected. We know that uh, there's saltwater intrusion. It's only a matter of time. Um, that this happens to us. So I think for us, work with flood control, work with FEMA, some of our state partners, federal partners, and try to come up with a plan that we can uh, address in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Spencer, same question to you. Absolutely, yeah. Fresh coming off the Reality Climate Summit in Los Angeles, the Al Gore training, I was down there for a few days ahead of the climate. How do you mostly attack the climate is you get involved and you start to think proactively. It's not transac transactional, it's transitional. Start bringing emotion into decision that happens at city council so we can move forward and start to reduce our fossil fuels, right? Oil is a very big industry in this town. It has been for over 100 years. Transition will have to take place through the city of Ventura into renewable energy sources, through the oil, and that's something that a progressive leader will need to do. We'll have to be able to work with industry creating positive economical outcomes to produce and convince them that moving forward with reducing fossil fuels is the answer. Thank you. And next we'll go to Alex. Same question on climate change. Thank you. So as you said, it's, it's, more of a, it's a long range question. And it's not, it will happen. And when we deal with it, I think one of the first things we have to look at is simply just the the infrastructure that's on the beach and that's on the shoreline. We have to figure out, make sure that it's reinforced, make sure that it's kept up. I mean, we've all, or at least I have, I've gone to the beach before, you know, over my lifetime and seeing when the pier, the pier's closed because they're, you know, they're fixing it, maintenance, whatnot. We have to make, keep that up because once the water, I mean, it's coming. That Once it rises, we have to be prepared for it. And as far as working to deal with the problems after the fact, and yes, we will have to, I agree, we have to go and speak with FEMA, we have to work with the county, we have to work even with our uh, sister city, Oxnard, because we're all, we're all on the beach. You know, we have to deal with this problem as a team. And that's, and of course, again, community, we'll figure it out together. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, same question to you about climate change. Well, I think it begins with a common understanding among all of us that climate change is real, it's happening and we have to take it extremely seriously. It's not something that is 30, 40 years away. It is happening right now as we sit in this room. A couple things, when I spoke to the general manager of water, he said, Eric, in 30 to 40 years, people are gonna be body surfing into the wastewater plant at the harbor. And what he meant by that is sea level rise is real. So long term, this council has to begin addressing where does that wastewater plant go because it's no longer going to be sustainable at its existing location. Secondly, fire. Climate change has made Ventura and other areas of our state tinderboxes. We have to address defensible spaces, fire retardant approaches, and long term solutions that don't make us vulnerable to fire. Third climate change action plans. We adopted one for energy. We also signed into the Los Angeles Community Choice Energy Plan so that all of you could have choices other stop, than Southern California there, Eric. Edison. And Eric, I'll ask if you could just put that water bottle on the floor, please, or whoever's water bottles there. Just put it on the floor. That gives our uh, photographers a little better shot. So all of these things I have to manage up here. I appreciate all the things. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Ed, we're going to start with you on the next question. Let's talk about something close to home, the East End here. Tell us about your views regarding uh, library funding. Uh, as far as the East End, there is a new library at the Hill Road, but do you think that uh, there should be more things brought to the East End? And your view about growth in general here on the East End? Well, like I said, stated before, the uh, East End has been neglected on proper funding. The roads and sidewalks are horrible in our community. Uh, that needs to be addressed for the East End people. I mean, we lived, that, lived with that for decades. Uh, when it comes to libraries, I would love to see a satellite library and the mobile library with the county at Kimball Park. 
I think that would be a great venue for our community. Uh, also possibly the senior citizens. I think they have a lot to offer our young and youth. Um, and th that's my issues right there. Okay, thank you. thank you. We'll move on to Alex. Same question about the East End and the library. Thank you. As far as the library goes, yes, we did just open a new one. But yes, I, we need another. We, as somebody who lives on the far east end of town, on Wells and Telegraph, yeah, it, I mean, it's only 10 minutes, but why should our, f our fifth graders that are doing their fifth grade project, our fourth graders that are doing their book reports, our sixth graders, why should they have to figure a way to get, you know, if they have low income housing, which some do on, throughout our city, but how, why should they have to figure out a way to get there? We should make it more accessible to them. Because again, and I can attest to this as somebody who has, again, has gone through our school system and has, I consider myself lucky to have gone through the school system. Yes, we have to grow the libraries. We have to grow, again, as I said earlier, we have to grow our grocery stores. We have to make things more accessible to the East End people. That means adding things out there. There's the infrastructure in some ways is already there. We just have to use what we have. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, candidates, I know it's warm up here. If any of you want some water, we have some here. I'm happy to sell you a bottle. <laughs> so, uh, but no, just wave at me and I'll bring you a bottle if you're thirsty. Right, we are. Okay, uh, Eric, we'll go on to you. Same question about library funding. Is the Hill Road Library enough? And what are your thoughts about growth on the East End? I want to begin by acknowledging some very special people in this audience, among them Kathy Thompson, Friends of the Library. Under her leadership and the Friends of the Library, we helped. Okay, I'll let we, that go. We helped open Hill Road Library and also Supervisor Bennett and the County Board of Supervisors. I gave a $25,000 check to the Hill Road Library at its opening. Thereafter, we committed 50000 annually to that library. That's significant. That's Measure O proceeds that you all voted for that help support a local East End library. Long term, would I like to see a library in the community center that's identified in the Kimball Park Master Plan? Absolutely. But I will say, and I see Jim in the audience right now, I listened to the Park and Recs Commission. Our most, pri our most urgent priority is circulation and parking, which we're going to address by extending Ramali and putting 250 parking spaces at Ventura Community Park. Thank you. Mike, we'll go to you. Your thoughts about East End growth and the library. So growing up, um, you know, my parents took me to the Wright Library over there by the college. Um, it uh, was sorely missed, uh, you know, for my kids. They didn't have access to something like that on, on our end of town. I do think we need to have something. Uh, we do need to have a library, especially in the Far East End. Um, I think Community Park, um, you know, is a possibility, but I, I'm looking for something further east. Uh, I also think, too, that libraries, uh, you know, serve a... Uh, more than now, just, just reading material, there's reference. We can partner with uh, the local law school in the area to maybe do a combination law library and regular library um, and work in partnership with them to get something like that in the East End. Um, for It's accessible to all our community. Thank you. Spencer, we'll wrap up with you on the East End question. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to see a great library and parks improved on the East End drastically. Five years ago, we heard council talk about an attention to libraries and parks, and we have Kimball Park, which is completely unfinished, and a library downtown that nobody feels safe at on the bottom floor, and an air conditioning that doesn't work. So where has the attention been to parks and libraries for this whole time? And it comes to involvement of the seniors in this community and the quality of life that they have. My grandfather is 93 years old. I've been taking, taking care of him for the last few years. We need to look at extending the quality of life of seniors, giving them the opportunity to volunteer, giving them the amenities to where they can actually have something to look forward to on their day in and day out. And we have that right at Kimball Park, right where we've been looking for for a long time, a senior center, a library, basketball courts, a playground, a complete community space that you can do a one-stop shop, learn, educate, and grow together in the community. We have an opportunity. It hasn't been completed lately. Let's let new leadership come into city council and make the things happen. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. And we'll go back to our District 5 and District 6 candidates. One of the questions we heard earlier for this end was about jobs. Marie, we'll start with you first. What do you believe you could do as a council member to bring good paying jobs to the city of Ventura? Boy, nobody understands that more than me. I was one of those people on the road two hours a day, and that was a quality of life hit that I don't want back. So I really want to get local good-paying jobs out here, and 
You know, that's one reason why I'm the only candidate up here that's been endorsed by the carpenters, and they tell me they spend too much time out on that road driving to work, and it's not right. Uh, one problem we have is we have a two-person economic development department down at City Hall, and those two people are both brand new and they're doing a great job, but we need to do better as far as promoting Ventura as a great place to live and work. We can do better working with our local businesses to make sure, one thing is that net zero water fee, and boy, we definitely need to pay for water projects, but it's sort of a blunt instrument when it comes to commercial properties. Um, it's just based on square footage and it is not based on water usage at all. And, and if you look at the new 24-hour fitness, that was... Have to stop you there, Maria. $300,000. Uh, Maria, I'll have to you. stop you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Jim, we're going to move on to you. Same question. How will you bring high-paying jobs to Ventura? I think I would concentrate on the businesses that we, we already have here. It's much easier to develop and nurture existing businesses than try to go out and get new ones, especially since we don't have the housing stock. That's why Kinko's left town, one of our largest employers, uh, Plano, Texas, took them because there were plenty of houses at one half the price that we had here in Ventura for those same employees. We have an auto center. That, and, a, and focus area one that is, is ripe for further development. We should be working with, as I mentioned, our existing businesses and doing whatever we can to streamline their expansion. They're already here, they already know the, 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 uh, the map of Ventura, so to speak. And we just have to, the city just has to get out of the way. I have seen business after business put through the, the meat grinder here and got stopped by the process and walked away and, and did nothing. And we have to stop that. We have to streamline our process and, and do what we can to. Thank you, Jim. Thank Lori, you. same question to you. Yeah, first I want to say infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Second, I want to say when you're talking about my district specifically, um, revitalizing the Johnson Corridor, that is, uh, the first part of the city that people see when they come in and the two plazas on either side of Johnson are poor, very blighted and gentrified. We just lost Toys R Us and the theater's been gone for a while. Um, sidewalks uh, in Montalvo, so it's a recently annexed part of the city. And they've, Proposition 6, I'm saying vote. Um, uh, I'm forgetting which way you're supposed to go. <laughs> Too much stuff to remember. But essentially, do not vote so that the gas tax is removed. We need to keep it so that we can uh, build our infrastructure and our bridges. And one of the projects that would be axed would be the project to put sidewalks in Montavo. And then the last thing I, I'm saying is an Aldi's on the east side. It doesn't have to be an Aldi's, but we need a grocery store on the east side, not a convenience store, not a gas station. I'll stop you there. Charles, we'll wrap up with you on the question of bringing high paying jobs to Ventura. Well, I, first of all, I want to say that all jobs are good jobs. So if you create more jobs, there's more competition for the workers, then the wages are just going to go up for, through that competition. Um, we also really need to address the net zero. It affects businesses that are already here as well as ones that want to come to the community. I think that that uh, fee should be at very least spread over a five-year period. Uh, it should not be stopping people from coming here. Um, lastly, I want to say that I've been endorsed by uh, the iron workers and the uh, Leona labor unions because I want to see middle-class people being able to work in this community, stay in this community, not have to travel all over the freeway system. And the only way we can really do that is by working regionally, again, on uh, addressing the housing needs, seeing what the stocks are that are actually out there, what we need so that we can bring in larger employers, we don't lose uh, large employers that are already here, and uh, keep the jobs in the community. Thank you. Jim, we're going to start with you, and one of the things that we've heard is the amount of pension hikes that are coming is going to be a significant challenge to every city council member. So I want to give the four of you at that end a chance to tell us what you would do facing such large increases. What will you do to ensure the costs uh, are covered uh, without bankrupting the city? Would you reopen contracts with unions? What are your plans? 
This is uh, probably one of my biggest concerns, and I think one of the things that we can do is to actually be talking about it on a regular basis, not just talk about it at forums or during the budget cycle at the council. When I was on the council, we used to meet, if there were four Mondays or five Mondays a month, we met every Monday, and four or five Mondays a month. I think we should, prob we should take one of the, the Mondays where we only meet three, uh, th three days a week or three days a month, and use it as a budget workshop so we can make our budget a lot more transparent. The, the problem with, the, with our pensions, when Social Security was first for, started, there were 35 workers for every one person who was uh, ex, uh, collecting. In the city of Ventura, we have 1.6 retired individuals re retired and per one person working. That's obviously not sustainable. It requires a lot more than one minute to answer, but we need to be talking about it on a quarterly basis at the City Council. Thank you. Charles, same question to you about pensions. Okay, um, I have been involved with the uh, Venturans for Responsible and Efficient Government for 13 years or so. Um, we, one of the big issues and what got us started basically was looking at pensions. And uh, unfortunately, people weren't listening. Uh, I, we, no matter what we pumped out, people just were not paying attention. So it's great that it's here now, but this is one of the unfortunate things that our city councils in the past have just continued to kick down the road and not addressed. And now we are in a very serious situation where they say if there is a downturn, we may go bankrupt. So we have to address this now. And as I told the, uh, the city's workers, I said, you know, guys, I want to work with you and we need to have a plan that's going to work for 50 years out. It has to be addressed now so that we can, we as a city, as taxpayers, can be assured that uh, we're not going to go bankrupt and things aren't going to get worse, but also so that the city employees have that guarantee and they're going to be able to do their job. So it needs, it needs to be addressed. You're right, Jim. Thank you. Marie, your thoughts on dealing with the pension issue? Well, in some ways, we're better than we were 20 years ago because now our employees are required to kick in to pay towards their pension. I think last year, employees kicked in about $4 million. The city kicked in about $18 million. So that's a better place than we were maybe 20 years ago. Uh, I do not believe in dismantling existing promises to employees. That is not something I would ever ask anyone to do. I do believe that our employees care very much about the city and the amount of services we can provide. And at some point, if we get to that point, we can go back to our employees and say, what else can we do? But that needs to be a negotiation between our employees and the city and involving the entire community. And that, I think, people are reasonable, and that is what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Lori, we'll wrap up the question with you. As a member of SCIU 721, I understand the need to protect working families in the city of Ventura. Working families is what built the middle class here and what it supported my family. My father, he worked for Union 76 for years and for almost 30 years was able to support his family that way. So to dismantle retirement for those who are already in retirement only creates another problem and causes more seniors to be homeless because if they are priced out of the community or can no longer pay their rent that's going up, that creates another issue. I do support negotiating, as uh, someone else mentioned, continue to negotiate those new employees who come in. But those who had already been promised and worked hard for 30, 20 or 30 years, I don't think should be taken away from them. If there's a choice between furloughs and layoffs, okay, I would lean toward furloughs. Um, but if it was a question between making more cuts and creating revenue, I'm gonna lean more towards let's try to create more revenue. Okay, Lori, we're going to begin the next question with you, and it deals with city staff. So part of it is around public safety, the amount of overtime that uh, has to be paid for the police and fire departments. Do you have plans addressing that? And also, would you support contracting out various services, not just public safety, but within City Hall? Share with us your thoughts on contracting services and dealing with high overtime costs. So I do support um, over time when necessary, specifically when we're talking about police officers. So if we have police officers out on the beat, on the ground, uh, responding to our calls because there's criminal activity occurring and someone needs to be arrested and their shift is over, they cannot just simply walk away. 
they need to finish what they're doing and they should be paid uh, that wage because they are at a high risk and that's what the higher wage is covering, the fact that they're putting their lives on the line for us every day. Um, what was the second part of the Contracting question? out services. So I do not support contracting out services. I would listen to a conversation about it, but of course, working families and wages, full-time regular wages, is what I support first. Thank you. Marie, same question to you about contracting out services and dealing with high overtime costs. Generally, I do not believe in contracting out services. However, we needed to do this uh, post-fire. We need to bring some extra people into the fire, or to uh, the planning department. Um, also, the city does not have enough grant writers, and there's a lot of money out there that we could access as a city. And I know that we brought in some additional grant writers to find those funds from the city or excuse me, from the state and the federal government. Um, as far as overtime costs, I think one problem we have down at the city, the last time I heard, we were 60 employees down over there. And, and there's got to be some reason why we have this big exodus from City Hall. If we could get our fire police, I know fire was down for a long time, fully staffed, I think we could work on that issue quite successfully. And of course, the rest of our rank and file of workers, we need to replace those folks that have left the building. And it's basically just treating people well down there. I'd like to see us work on our HR issues have down to at stop City you Hall. there, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. And Charles, same question to you about uh, your views on contracting out services and dealing with high overtime costs. Okay, first of all, um, as I told all the uh, people that have interviewed us, I want to communicate with everybody. I want to get information from everybody. So I would never say, oh, I'm not going to contract stuff out. Uh, we need to look at all the issues as they come along. Now, on the other hand, with the city employees in particular, we need to have real direction from city council through our city manager so that they know exactly what direction that we are going in. And I don't want to see, I want to work real hard to make sure that we're not doing four to three votes. I want to see real support of things where everybody's gotten a piece of something so we can really tell our city manager and our staff this is where we're going and then we'll be much more efficient. And lastly, with the, uh, the police in particular have just been, uh, when I met with them, they were really uh, overwhelmed by the amount of overtime that they're having to work. And I would much prefer to have a couple more officers out there, uh, hire a couple more officers to eliminate some of that overtime and that stress that they're under. So that's what I would like to see. Thank you. Jim, we'll wrap up with you. Thank you. Uh, generally speaking, I would not be in favor of contracting, but if there was an area where we needed some expertise that we didn't have in the city, where we really didn't have a choice, well then I would be open-minded to it. With regard to overtime, there's a fine line between um, the cost of overtime and then the cost of hiring new employees. Uh, for the, generally speaking, in the way that our police department and fire department are balancing, it's less expensive to offer overtime than hiring new employees because you have all the, uh, the additional employee costs. But you do, you do stretch it to the point where you have overly tired employees, and that's affecting the safety of our residents. So it's, it's, it's a balancing act. It's a fine line. I think there is a place for overtime. But I would also like to see the city be able to hire some more essential employees. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we only have about two hours left, so I'll see how many questions. No, I'm going to run out of time. I'm serious. I'm apologizing to you in advance for not having enough time to get to all of your questions. This will have to be the last question, and we are going to begin with Spencer on this one. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a second one in case you finish early, but the first question is, you know, tell us your thoughts about campaign finance within the city, how uh, it works around funding a campaign, the outside groups that contribute, and if you have time after that, maybe you could share your thoughts about oil and gas development in Ventura. I know that's a lot for one minute, but I didn't want you to not use your allotted time, so I'm giving you an opportunity. I'm, yeah, they're very similar. I'm going to tackle the campaigning on the okay. east side of Ventura and in District 4. And being somebody who's been going and asking for donations from my friends and family, I can say I'm pretty proud. I'm about $3,200, and I've worked hard for every penny that I've earned. 
Well, other representatives up here are going to earn up to close to twenty-five to thirty-two thousand dollars to infiltrate you with mailers and infiltrate you with all these different things. There's no substance to that. Spencer Norn is walking and knocking on every door individually myself. Every sign that you've seen in the streets with my name on it, I have struck that sign in the ground myself as well. I am working my tail off to show the people of Ventura how hard I'm going to work, how I'm willing to learn and to listen and to grow with this community because I am all in. I am going to walk down the road that my grandparents paved on Telegraph Road. It wasn't by my choice. I was given this task. I have the passion in my heart to represent you in District 4. I will not let you down. I will not waver. Thank you for your vote. Okay, thank you. Mike, same question to you about your views on campaign finance, yeah. specific groups, PACs, etc. Mm -hmm. And if you have time, oil and gas. <laughs> so I too, along with Spencer, uh, I, I have been asking you know, friends and family for, for money, and I've also raised uh, close to that amount as well. Um, what I like about you know, the, the campaign finance in the city of Ventura is it, it does you know, get more, it's more personal. Uh, I do like the fact that there are limits. That, you, know, you can't go to a business and ask for thousands and thousands of dollars. You know, they can only give you 325. Um, so that forces you to go out there and, and hustle, and I think that makes you a better candidate. Uh, I, too, have put up every sign myself. Uh, as well, and I think, you know, I'm also knocking on doors. If I haven't uh, knocked on your door yet in District 4, I will get to you eventually. Um, we've still got a, a month or so to go, uh, but I do think that, uh, that what we did in Ventura is, is positive. Okay, thank you. Ed, same question to you about campaign finance. Uh, I, I'm a strong supporter of can, can, campaign financing. There should be a cap. It makes it easy for everybody to run. And that's what it should be, especially the districts. And this is how it came to light that the Easton was being disenfranchised with a lot of other parts of Ventura. So for me, I'm, I'm really happy for campaign financing. Um, I'm self-funding myself. I wouldn't be able to do it if it was a general election. Um, for those that are getting interest money from specialized groups, it's going to be very hard for you to say no to them when they want something. So. You need to look at the big picture when they say, well, I got this money, much money from this group and this group. Well, we're in hard times. The city's basically broke. And you hear this from most candidates that we don't have the money. There's not a magical wand to fix this and that and that. So for me, I'm very supportive of can campaign financing and happy that it has occurred. Okay, thank you. Eric, we'll go to you next. Your thoughts about uh, PACs and the amount of cost to run a campaign, campaign finance? Historically, the Ventura City Council in the mid-1990s enacted the Campaign Reform Ordinance, which I support, just so everyone's aware, on the eve of each election cycle, both the contribution limit as well as the expenditure ceiling are adjusted commensurate with inflation. So for example, in this election cycle 2018, the max per person you can get is $325, either from a person or an organization, and the maximum you can spend as a candidate is $34,000. I think that's sensible, and I'll tell you why. It prevents the aggregation of power in one group or individual. They're capped out just like everybody else. I spoke to a colleague in a neighboring city and I asked, well, how much can you get per person? And he said, unlimited. You understand that that can be a recipe for uh, some type of misfortune because one person can give an unlimited amount of money to one candidate, thus curring favor and influence down the road. I also think that this is a new frontier in elections. We're now by district, so it's much have more- have to stop you there, Eric. Sorry. Okay, Alex, same question to you about campaign finance. Thank you. Campaign finance is, uh, it's very interesting as I'm, I'm learning, as this is our first district election and as I'm getting involved in it, there's a lot to it. There's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of new rules that you have to learn every week of, oh, wait, I spent that. I have to fill out this form. There's so many things that I'm learning, and it's, it's amazing. It's so exciting and invigorating to see that there are things in place to keep us honest. And similar to Ed, I am currently entirely self-funded, and it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It's great at one aspect because, yeah, I have, there is no, there's no, I have to say yes, or there's no, I have to talk to this person, but not this person. I'm, I'm just me. I'm me, and I'm, we're together. I'm figuring this out, self-funded. The other end of it is things are expensive, but I'm enjoying it. So I, campaign finance is exciting. Thank you. 
Thank you. Jim, we'll go to you next. Your views on campaign finance. Um, I'm, per I'm perfectly fine with it. I was skeptical initially about the, um, the districts to begin with. I wasn't sure that the, our city was large enough to uh, require it. But now after vis visiting with my neighbors, really getting to know my specific district, um, I am actually a fan of, of districts now. So thank you to uh, thank you to the city of Ventura for making that happen. Um, as far as the, the, the finance limits, uh, they seem fair. Although I, I heard from my friend Sarab that the school board has no limit whatsoever. And if that's true, I don't know how that could possibly be. But I think that the city certainly needs to look into that as well. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Charles, same question to you. What are your views about campaign finance, the amount of money it costs, the outside groups, PACs, et cetera? Again, I've ran uh, probably about 70 campaigns. Uh, first thing I do is interview the candidate that I'm going to work with. Uh, there are probably about 10 that I ended up not working with. But uh, most of these came on referrals because when you've got good quality people, you want to get them elected. So the, the limits uh, here have prevented some very quality people. I worked with Lou Cunningham, who would have been a great city councilman. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it, the, with the limits, it was stacked for the incumbents. And there have been very few other people that have been elected uh, other than incumbents for years. So that's part of our problem. So now the districts, which I wasn't originally in favor of, have really shaken things up. And I got to tell you, it's uh, working very well. The amount of money is not really the important factor. In my bedroom community area of Montavo and, uh, and uh, to Montgomery, we, we, we can get out and literally walk and talk to every person. And I've always, last few years, it's been all about grassroots campaigns. And by God, that's what I'm doing out there. And it's working well. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Same question to you about campaign finance and the costs. Well, I got to say, one of my proudest volunteer endeavors is I'm a volunteer for the California Clean Money Campaign, which has worked very hard to pass statewide legislation, which is a model for the nation on getting big money out of politics. And I will tell you that I am not accepting money in my campaign from anyone who has business before the council right now. And what I do have is a small, a very, actually a large amount of donors who will give me $25 when they can, like my single, um, I have a friend, Molina, single mother of two, and she gives me $25 when she can. And those are the people that believe in me and know that I'm gonna do the right thing. And I can tell you, people do skirt that 325, because uh, their, their friends, relatives, and neighbors will all give to you too. And one thing I urge you all to do is look online at the Forum 460s and see who's paying who out there, and you will see how their vote will go when they're back and elected on city council. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. We'll wrap up the question with you. I always forget that. So many of you know I ran an at-large district in 2013 and 2016, and I got within 53 votes of unseating an incumbent. And in doing so, I was able, I raised the money, and I got in there and got the support of the community. But it was much more difficult to do than it is today. As a district, instead of reaching 7,000 voters, I only have to reach 4,300 households. Um, so the amount of money to spend on materials and everything is much less. So I was one of the spokespersons uh, for the organization who came to the city who um, lobbied for the city to go to districts because I understood that on the east side, we weren't getting as much representation as we could and that we could actually make that happen. Um, the Federal F Fair Practices and Political Commission is the state entity that regulates uh, how much money we can raise on a state level. And as uh, Eric mentioned, they, we have a local ordinance that adds on top of that. Um, and so I think it's a good thing because it equalizes everybody. And, and one of the things that I think is important as a council member is equitable policies. Um, and I'm oh, going to thank take, you, Lori. Oh, that's it. Sorry. Okay. How about a round of applause for these candidates? We're going to do closing statements in just a moment, but a couple of announcements first. As I said, we have flyers here. If you're interested, the city has provided it, listing the various districts so you can figure out where you live. The league has brochures in the back regarding the statewide propositions. I want to uh, do uh, some thank yous. First of all, this is being recorded by CAPS Media. It will uh, be available on their channels fairly soon, also on their website. 
But we have a lot of young students from El Camino High School that are working with CAPS and are helping to put this on. And I think that's great for our city and I'd like to give them all a round of applause. And you know if I said their names, they'd be so embarrassed. So I'm not going to do that, but they're all terrific. I also want to acknowledge all of the people from the League of Women Voters. They will let me say their names. So we had timers up front. We had Maddie and Maria helping there. Sorters, we had Cheryl and Mulaney. Uh, in the back, we have Carol who helped to put everything on. Betsy, the president you met earlier. Uh, I see Kay and Karen and Pat Essek are helping as well. Beth and um, Nancy and um, Doris as well. To all of them, how about a nice round of applause for them as well. As I said, we're all volunteers. This is our third one this week, seventh in two weeks. We still have about five more to go around the city. Nobody realized when they did districts that that would be more work for the league. I mean, you know, there was no consideration. And same thing happened in Oxnard. We had two out there as well. So as far as it goes, it's now time for our closing statements. We're going to go in reverse order. You have one minute. We'll begin with Charles Kistner. First of all, again, thank you to everybody for coming out and participating in this and getting involved in your community. And uh, hopefully some of you are from District 6, and certainly hopefully people from District 6 will take a look at this. Um, I want you to be aware that I have a website that you can go to at kistnerforventuracitycouncil.com. So we've got a calendar on there. There's updates all the time. There's endorsements and everything, information about our campaign. I think the last thing I want to leave you guys with is that it's very important that if you support any of the candidates, but especially myself, that you get out there and talk to people, inform people, share the conversation. This has to come from the community. Again, it's a grassroots situation where uh, we're going to knock on doors, we're going to hand out our flyers, we're going to send you some stuff in the mail, but the bottom line is that talking to your neighbors, sharing these conversations, seeing what you really want, what you like about us, the difference between the two of us, the issues that we stand on, how do you support us based on that? So. I hope that you look at the issues, look at what we send you, and uh, look forward to your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Lori Brown. So I just want to leave you with this, that um, not only am I native and qualified and ready to serve the city of Ventura as your next council member in District 6, I want you to know as an educator, some people are like, okay, what did you do? Well, I was a substitute teacher for the Ventura Unified School District last year. And it was a field of work that I wish I had more opportunity to be in, but you have to be credentialed to get in there full time. But my master's is in public policy and administration, so I had to go back to my work area. But um, I care about the children in this community, and I care about the future of the city of Ventura. And I'd like to get on the council so that you have somebody that is for equitable policies, who wants to revitalize Johnson Corridor, who understands how redevelopment works and how public budgeting works. So again, vote for me, native, qualified, City of Ventura, Count City Council, District 6. Thank you. Thank you. And as a reminder, those were the two candidates for District 6. We'll now move on to District 5. Jack Selby is a candidate in that district, but he did not respond or attend tonight. Um, our two candidates are Jim Friedman first. We'll start with you, Jim. Thank you, and thank you all for taking the time to be with us here this evening. <clears throat> Based on the questions, it's obvious that Ventura has some challenging times ahead. Uh, one of the things that wasn't mentioned is it's been 10 years plus since we've had a recession, so it's not a matter of if, but rather when. I've been a financial planner for over 40 years, and I believe that a person with extensive financial and budgeting experience would be an asset to the city council. There's not, there's not currently an individual with that expertise. People have asked me why I'm running again, and the answer is really simple. I really do care about this community. I love Ventura. It embraced me when I first moved here in 1990. I've lived in the same house ever since. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to help the, the city council meet the challenges that we are going to have to face over the next four years. And I abs Thank you, Jim. Appreciate you stopping on time. Our next candidate is Marie Lakin, also District 5. 
I have the longest list of endorsements of all the Canada and all the Ventura Council races. And this is a broad group of folks who have worked with me on many projects and know that my heart is in service. My volunteer work in Ventura led me to being named Ventura Citizen of the Year by the Ventura Chamber of Commerce, an outstanding citizen by the California Teachers Association for all my work in the schools. Somebody recently told me, Marie, if you win this race, you're gonna have power. And I said, no, I'm not gonna have the power. The people of East Ventura are gonna have the power. And as I said earlier, I have made a vow to not accept campaign contributions from those who have business coming before the council. I am gratified by the many individuals who are supporting me with no agenda, knowing that I have no agenda other than the trust that I will represent their community interests well. At the end of the day, I will still have my integrity. I am a public servant. I have been one my entire life, and there will be not one day thank, if I am elected, you, I will forget that. Thank, thank you. you. We'll now move into our District 4 candidates. Our first one is Eric Masarenko. Thank you very much, David. I remember November 5th, 2013, Arlene Martinez from the Ventura County Star called me and said, it looks like voter turnout's gonna be about 25%. What are you gonna do about that? And what I decided to do was take it to you, the voters, to change the way we conduct our elections. So that is why now in 2018, we're voting on an even year cycle. Not only has it reduced election related costs, because we can consolidate with other races, it's also boosted turnout significantly. The other thing in 2016, I remember sitting down with our city manager and our assistant city manager and saying, you know, everyone says we've got all these needs, but we don't have any money to pay for them. Why don't we go back and float a half cent sales tax? It didn't pass in 2006, it didn't pass in 2009. We took it to the voters in 2016 and it passed by 59%, which is why we have money for a homeless shelter, for Hill Road, and for police and fire. I'd be honored to have your vote again, thank you. Thank you, our next candidate is Alec Gaska. Thank you for being here, thank you for supporting us, thank you for taking an interest in this campaign, in this election. This is just so important to our city, and as, as an individual who was raised here, I've been here since I was born at CMH, and my family's been here since this city was founded. We, it's just such an honor to be part of this, and I hope that I can earn your vote by my commitment to being your councilman. Not a councilman, but your councilman. Together, we can change the way things are. However it is you want it to be. We will do it together because now, especially with how we've moved with districts, that's possible. It's possible for us to do this together, to change the city. And through my work, again, as I've done in the past, with I work with Knights of Columbus as vice president, my work with Catholic Charities, my work with other institutions throughout the city, I'm prepared to be there for you and to do this together. And there's a quote really quick. Together we may not have it all, but to, to get, we may not have it all together, but together, we can have it all. Okay, thank you. thank you. And our next candidate is Spencer Noren. Thanks, David. Spencer Noren, Ventura City Council, District 4. Thank you. I want to first start off by saying thank you to my wife, who's watching at home shortly. I love you very much. I couldn't be here without you. No good deed goes unpunished. That is what I've learned so much as I've stepped into this political realm and put myself out there for the people of Ventura to be a leader of the East Side. I'm not red, I'm not blue, I'm red, white, and blue. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not left, I'm not right. I'm right in the middle with my heart for you. I'm an independent, I'm a 38-year-old man, and I'm here to serve the people of Ventura. I like people, I love animals, and I will protect Mother Nature. I'm a well-rounded man who knows how to be a leader and to work with community leaders. Thank you for council members that were all here today, Mrs. Heitman, Mrs. Weir, Mr. Levere. These are great people who I know I can work with. I ask for your vote. Thank you so much. Spencer Norn, District 4. Thank you. Our next candidate is Ed Alamillo. As a candidate, I've always advocated for the East End. I want to address the horrible traffic conditions on Wells Road and Kimball and, and mandate a comprehensive traffic study. I also want to address the wasteful spending in our tax dollars. That includes vehicle telematics to monitor cars' performance, GPS to monitor vehicles' whereabouts. That's what you call a supervisor. Measure O was initially sold to us to fix our roads and sidewalks. The bike paths off of Montgomery 
and uh, telephone. What can I say? It's, it's wasteful spending. It's hardly ever used. I used to commute to the government center every day during the week. And like I said, it's wasteful spending. I want to look at this, this wasteful spending and address it to save our general fund money for other projects that we really need, like our roads and sidewalks. Please look at my website. It's updated weekly at Alameda, Ventura City. Thank you. Thank you. And our next candidate is Mike Morostica. Thank you. Again, um, I thought long and hard uh, before I decided to, to run in this election. I, for several reasons, I decided to, to take the leap and it was due to a number of issues that I want to solve and I want to help you guys. I want to help make Ventura a better place. Uh, I want to be able to help you, uh, help all of us solve that criminal vagrancy problem. Nobody up here has the experience of boots on the ground in dealing with that criminal vagrancy issue than I do, and I will work hard to eliminate that. I think Ventura deserves uh, a safe environment. You deserve to be in public areas and feel safe, and I'm going to help you do that. I think Ventura deserves clean streets, clean neighborhoods. I also think uh, Ventura deserves uh, good paying jobs. Uh, the East End deserves businesses that they can go to that are close by, like grocery stores, dry cleaners, restaurants. So if you want to help make Ventura safe, clean, and prosperous, I ask for your vote on November 6. Thank you. Thank you, and I um, apologize again not being able to get to all the questions. There were quite a few. They were terrific. I just had to make decisions about what we could do. Also, if you enjoyed tonight, there's a tip jar on our uh, membership table if you want to help support the league. How about one last round of applause for all these candidates?